Can you hear me? Yeah? Okay. 1 Kings 19. And uh, verse 4. It says, Elijah went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree and he prayed that he might die. Life is full of surprises and uh, some of them not very nice. And problems for all of us come our way. Each one of us here would have had days where have been very difficult or painful or full of trouble. And Elijah had one of those because the Queen Jezebel, who ruled over the northern part of Israel, threatened his life. So he'd uh, run from there, down to the south part of Judah, down to the southmost part of Judah, first way he could from Beersheba, but even there, uh, Jezebel's family were uh, also in Judah, and also the Baal pagan witchcraft was also present, which Jezebel triumphed and uh, wanted to be uh, promote. And so um, he fled, left a servant at Beersheba, and went into the desert. So he was in the desert on his own, praying that he might die. What a surprise that would be to those who heard of Elijah, the man who'd uh, stood up against the king, who'd brought uh, uh, drought by uh, stating God would bring uh, no rain for three years while they. Uh, to allow the people of God to repent, how he'd, how he'd uh, made a sacrifice and God had sort of uh, sovereignly uh, made it come alive with, uh, with, with lightning or with uh, just come fire. And the people of God had then declared, the Lord he is God, the Lord he is God. That only happened a few days ago. Elijah had done nothing wrong, yet he suddenly found himself on his own, praying he would die. You can, um, you can appear, you see the others would appear in the celebrity status, wouldn't know what it's like on the inside. And the problems of life affect, our, affect us on the inside. It's in the private world where it can be seen. There may be smiles outwardly, but our hearts can be burdened. And it's, God doesn't look at the outward appearance he looks at the heart, so he sees. But he doesn't act to Elijah's praise. Then he acts by coming and uh, an angel first of all comes and gives him a, a cake and a jar of water. Elijah in deep pray, pain. Addicts are told that uh, when they, uh, to avoid what they call a halt, Avoid H for hunger, avoid anger, A, avoid loneliness, L, avoid tiredness, T, because those can be trigger points to return back to those addictions. Elijah had all three. Hunger, he hadn't eaten anything. He was angry. 
I'm no better than my father's. Angry at himself, as well as angry at the situation that was around the country. Lonely, on his own in the desert, and tired from running away from that witch, Jezebel. Now his prayer content was he wanted to die. Start of all this is when fear entered his heart when the, he received that letter from the, from the Queen. Fear is an alternative belief system to faith. Faith puts our trust in God. Fear puts the trust in, oh, this might happen, that might happen. Oh, dear me. And the mountains of problems rise up big and God becomes small. It was that famous philosopher, Raymond Clegg, who said to me this week, <laughs> negativity, negativity feeds negativity. You believe negative and reject the positive. In such a situation, you welcome problems and deny solutions. And sometimes the uh, gas balloon religion encourage us to make such a deal about our problems. More of that than a great deal about God. Well, what God does is he provides food and tell them to rise and eat. He doesn't give him a seminar on spiritual warfare on the, on the Jezebel spirit. He doesn't give him a, uh, even a uh, pastoral, let's talk about your journey. Uh, he, he doesn't do, uh, uh, he just says, arise and eat. Because in your journey from trouble, you cannot focus on what to do. You just need help with the present. So when the church meets the broken, the answer is not seminars or lots of pastoral teaching. It's actually food banks friendly, non-judgmental people, welcome. So a rise and eat happens twice. First time, and then the second time, uh, a, a day later, I'm assuming, the angel of the Lord, verse 7, came back a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for you. Now notice, God hadn't called him on this journey. He was going on this journey anyway. And this is a reminder to us that God comes alongside us where we are at. Jesus, take me as I am. I can come no other way. He says, arise and eat. Here's a man praying to die. And God says, arise and eat. Now what he's doing here is he's giving the chance to make a choice small choice towards life eating for life rather than praying for death and so there's a, in that little choice that he makes on that first time that allows God to do more and he begins to say I'm with you in your journey now what Elijah's doing is he's going on a journey he's towards Sinai which is Another 200 miles further south than where he is at the moment in the wilderness. And so he's saying, arise and eat. And he goes on the strength of this uh, 40 days to, to get to uh, uh, Sinai, or called Horab in this, uh, in this passage, the same, same place. The, there was a, a repentance there. There was a, some opening for God to give, do more with him. Than, than was because he'd started responding to God. And so some of uh, you can perhaps remember when you first came to church you didn't know anything about God or anything or even feeling necessarily, but God started to work in your life. Or you started to pray. You'd never done prayer before, but you started to pray. Or you started to have that friend who was a Christian who you, you began to have something more start happening in your life as a result of this because when we make responses to God God responds back to us I've got down here in my notes that uh, 
some of you may have turned toward your heart towards God in a crisis I mean drawn to come to church the church was friendly and you felt better for it for us it may have been because people from church helped with food or care for others you were desperate because you saw no way out you faced an illness or addiction or some other of life's cruel twists you found a church, a place of welcome where you could belong, where you could feel like you again. It doesn't matter what situation we're in, God speaks. He prays, God acts. Even when we're running away from God, God can meet us. He, he spoke to Jonah on a ship, remember, it was flying away. He knew what to do, throw me in the water, he said. And here is Elijah facing death and God speaks to him there. My son uh, uh, Ben went to um, China and he met an underground pastor there and he spoke to him about uh, this underground pastor, saying to him how he became a Christian. He was in prison in China for, because for, for not bowing down to the uh, Chairman Mao's um, picture and he was about to commit suicide. And as he stepped out of the prison cell onto a ledge to jump, he, he heard his heart beating. And the heart beating was in the, reminding him of words in um, Chinese which uh, speak about life. And he thought, there must be something more about this. So he, he started seeking God from that moment. And God started meeting him at that place, where that very place of, 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 of down. You see, he'd arose and eaten had, uh, had Elijah, but he needed to still travel to Sinai because it's all very well having the food you need or the help you need, but actually you really need an encounter with God yourself. Jesus spoke of eternal life as knowing God, having a relationship with him. And what Elijah needed was uh, not an explanation about the problems of the world, or the, uh, what he ought to do. He needed he need to know he, was, he had a relationship with God. And at this point, he's, he, he's going to uh, Sinai. And he's going there because he wants to go back to his roots. We, 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 we know why he was going, because God asks him. That's when he gets there. He says, uh, he says, why are you here? And he says, I've been very zealous for God. Uh, and the children of Israel forsake your covenant, torn by your altars, killed your prophet with sword, I alone have left and seek to take my life. So um, he, was, he was zealous for God and it, it hadn't worked so he's going back to his roots. Now contained in these verses a call for us to develop good, good roots in the days where, th where we can do. So in the days of trouble we can return to them. It, uh, good roots are things I'm thinking about like, say, uh, coming to church regularly, um, reading your Bible regularly, praying uh, uh, routinely regularly, write, uh, having a journal if you want to, which you write verses of God's spoken so you can return to those verses, Re recording your own testimony so you can lay, play it back to yourself on your tele telephone. Whatever, whatever it is, you to, to, so you go back to those roots which once you knew. For when there's trouble comes, you, don't, you sometimes need to you get your balance again. Well, here is, here is, uh, um, in, um, here is Elijah in, uh, in Sinai. And um, he, he is, uh, the word of the Lord comes to him. And it's, it's like he hears it within him. Uh, and he says, uh, and it says, go and stand before the Lord. And uh, this is verse 11. Behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in peace before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, an earthquake, the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice. And he responds to that. Now, what I want to say is this is, when you're in days of trouble, you don't want lots of razzmatazz where God's not in it. How do you know God's in it? Because it makes a difference in your relationship with God. 
God's not in it if he's just sort of a wind, breaks the rocks and so what? Earthquakes, blitz, and nothing happens. And you meet people who are a lot of hot air, who say a lot, it means nothing. Or people who create all sorts of problems and all sorts of issues, but actually avail nothing. You don't listen to the, those where God is not in. Follow what God is in because you want an encounter with God. So when the still small voice happens, he responds, and then an external voice speaks to him saying, uh, what are you doing here, Elijah? Exactly the same words he'd heard in his heart earlier. That's how he knew that external voice was God. Sometimes you've been in a prayer meeting and hearing, a, hearing in your mind what you pray and somebody else prays that prayer. Ever had that experience and you've known it's the Lord? Or you've, or you've had a, um, a feeling about something and then something, it actually happens during that day. For months when I first came here, I would have a verse, random verse, which I'd be uh, just be in, in the service, in, in, before the service or during the week. It, was just, it could be some obscure verses. And you know what? It'd be spoken about in the church service somewhere. Somebody would quote that obscure verse. I'm thinking, hmm, God must be in this place. I knew it not. You know, that type of thing. So you can, you can find these things happen to you as a, as a normal, normal thing. But just uh, how do you know God's in something? Well, just, just, just some, uh, uh, some points here. Every real encounter with God has a future reference as well as a past one. Here is, uh, as God uh, meets him, he, he says, uh, Go return to your way to the wilderness of Damascus when you arrive, anoint Hazel, king of Syria, uh, Jehu, son of Simni, as king over Israel, and Elisha, the son of Shephrat, Shephrat, as a prophet in your place. Elisha is going to be his future uh, successor, who will actually do the anointing of Jehu and Hazael uh, some 40 years on from this encounter. God will always put something in the future as well as in the present and the past in the encounter. Now to you, it, 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 uh, to us, when God speaks about the future, it seems like an opportunity, a possibility, a hope before us, something that we think, oh yeah, that I can do that. It might be an immediate possibility. I could do this, but it might be a long-term thing. But there's always something future as well as present and past. It's a hope set before us, is what I would probably call it. We just know something about it. So uh, there is a... Uh, there is a uh, what I want to uh, finish with this is just saying when God, when you're uh, following God's path expect God to speak to you expect God to hear from you I was reading in Ezekiel this is, uh, about a fortnight ago I'm going through Ezekiel in my private uh, uh, devotion at the moment it says about rebellious not hearing and not seeing and uh, I think God said to me that means the obedient can see and can hear. It means that our inheritance is such that we should expect to see and hear God when we're on the path. So, for example, if you're called to uh, run a coffee morning, say, and you're on God's path, you're going to hear and see things about that, how that coffee morning should be that others won't necessarily see. You're going to be, if you're in, walking in a uh, particular path you're going to see something about the future possibility of that path as well as the present and the past expect god to see to, to speak to you expect to see things you wouldn't otherwise see god in you comes only by personal response we can be caught in a world where the uh, tide is were drawing away and those who thought to drift around with money and so on appear life hadn't any would be left isolated on the beach high and dry we need to have life within us we can't trust in the world's uh, economies 
or the world events. We need God in us, and it's only by personal response. And so what I'm going to do, I'm going to finish with a prayer of commitment, a prayer which, like I prayed when I first became a Christian, you may have prayed this prayer before, or may never have done so. But if you pray it in your heart, God will always respond, and will come to you. So pray asking God to come in your life, and stay there, and to show you the path to walk uh, each day that you live as you seek to follow him. So let's just pray as we, as we sit. Let's just pray as we pray. Lord Jesus, you see me and you know me. Thank you that you died on the cross so that I could be forgiven. I ask you, Lord, to come into my life, to forgive me, to cleanse me, to fill me, to renew me. Help me to walk with you. Thank you, you want to walk with me. Help me to follow you all the days of my life in complete obedience. You, my Lord and my Saviour. Amen. As we uh, just uh, rest in God's presence, just push your hands out to receive the presence of God. Just let Him just come. You may want to. Some of you may want to, as your mind, people may want to reflect on something you've heard as we've been speaking. But others may just want to receive. Just in the, in the quiet. Your own still small voice. Here God comes more as we respond to him. Thank you, Lord. Stay deep with us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Jonathan. If anyone has said that prayer for the first time and wants to discuss it with anyone, with Jonathan or Barb or Rich, just uh, any other leadership team, someone will be available after the service. So, let's stand and affirm our faith in God. Do you believe and trust in God the Father, source of all being and life, the one for whom we exist? We believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in God the Son, who took our human nature, died for us and rose again? We believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in God the Holy Spirit, who gives life to the people of God and makes Christ known in the world? We believe and trust in him. This is the faith of the church. This is our faith. We believe in one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. We remain standing now as we sing in heavenly armour, we'll enter the land. It's another music group video. Let's worship God with in heavenly armour, we'll enter the land. The battle belongs to the Lord.
Thank you. Please be seated as Barbara comes to lead us in our prayers. Let's pray and let's start by joining in the special prayer for today, the collect. Okay, in that case, I'll pray the prayer for today. <laughs> God of truth, help us to keep your law of love and to walk in ways of wisdom, that we may find true life in Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. Amen. And let's pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that you know and meet all our physical, emotional and spiritual needs, that just as you were with Elijah and are with all of us, who hope to run away from our troubles, you meet us where we are. Feed and restore us and give us fresh chances to follow you and your plans for our lives. Thank you, Father, for being the God of fresh starts and forgiveness. Help us to listen. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our Archbishops Justin and Stephen, the person you are calling to be our new Bishop of Hull. Fill them all anew with your Holy Spirit that by their teaching and their lives they may proclaim your word. We pray for your blessing on all church leaders in Bridlington and in particular Rich as he leads us over this summer at Emmanuel. And we pray for Richard, that he'll be refreshed and enjoy the chance to write and cycle with you. Help us to be the servants you have called us to be, and to do all we can to aid them in their ministry. And we pray for Matthew Pollard and Jane Penn, both leaving our deanery in September to undertake new ventures with you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless and guide Elizabeth, our Queen, and we thank you for the chance to celebrate her Platinum Jubilee. It was great to have something so positive to do. We pray today especially for the situation continuing in the Ukraine, and for all those throughout the world who are fleeing conflict and persecution. We pray for all those who are feeling overwhelmed by the hopelessness of their situation. Lord, we ask, give them your hope. Surround them with your love and power in their lives. Lord, may you bring your light to darkened minds and your love to hate-filled hearts. And we thank you that nothing is impossible for you. Help us to play our part and to partner with you to bring peace and reconciliation in our community. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for our families, friends and neighbours and for all who live in this town or are visiting. Help us all, every single one of us, to use our talents and resources, whether large or small, to love and serve one another and to share all that you have given us or are yet to give us. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. Lord, we bring to you all those who need your tender healing touch in their lives today. And we pause to remember those known to us. We pray for all those suffering from invisible illnesses like depression and long COVID. And we pray for the broken hearted and the broken spirited. Fill each one of us with your compassion and a willingness to really listen to others. We ask that you comfort and strengthen them 
and all those caring for them. And we ask for your guidance and wisdom, Lord. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. Lord, we remember those who've died recently, and we ask that you uphold their family and friends, surround them with your love. We thank you, Jesus, that through belief in you, death is the doorway to seeing you face to face and the end to all pain and tears. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. Father, as we go out from here, help us to remember that you want to be at the centre of our daily lives, 24-7, sharing the good and the bad, guiding and providing for us. Help us to listen more closely for your whispers to us, and help us daily to see you more clearly, love you more dearly, and follow you more nearly. And on this Father's Day, I'm going to use the words of Pete Gregg, founder of the 24-7 prayer movement, who wrote a prayer especially for today. A prayer for Father's Day. We pray today for dads, new dads, granddads, stepdads, adoptive dads and solo dads, baldy ones, beardy ones, skinny ones and cuddly ones. We pray for dads who tell bad jokes and dads who dance to YMCA. For dads who know how to fix things, and dads who just pretend to know. Father to the fatherless, we pray for those for whom this day is sadder rather than being happy. For those dads who feel they've failed. Those grieving children that they've never had. Those missing their dads, or their children, even more than usual. Father God, in a world where some dads are distant, absent, or even abusive, we lean into your ever-present love. You are faithful, especially to those of us orphaned, abandoned, and hurt. As it says in your word in Psalm 27, verse 10, Even if my father abandons me, the Lord will hold me close. And we claim that promise. Father of comfort, heal our wounds. Restore the dignity, integrity and centrality of fatherhood in our nation. And as St Paul says, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. And I pray that you may know love. And finally, Lord, for all those poor souls everywhere who forgot that today is Father's Day, we ask you to bless them in your abundant grace and manifold mercy and help them to find some chocolate and half-decent cards in the local shops before they're found out. Amen. <laughs> Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And we finish by joining in together in saying the prayer that Jesus taught them. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thank you, Bob. So we're now coming to our final song. Um, just before that, I'd just like to share something quite uh, that uh, springs to my mind about this song, um, considering it's Father's Day. My, my dad was my stepfather, and uh, he, he was a real good dad to me. And he had dementia, and uh, at the end of his life he had a stroke, uh, which actually um, took him. 
And the night before uh, he passed away, I was sitting with him <clears throat> during the night and I sang this next song to him. Um, he wasn't responsive or anything. And he died the following day. I, I don't think, I hope it wasn't to get away from my, from my singing, but uh, I'm sure it wasn't. But uh, no, he passed away the following day. But um, during that time and shortly after when, when our local minister came to pray with him, he, he, he did respond in some way to, to the prayer. He hadn't moved for days and he responded, he moved during this prayer. And it made me think about what Jonathan said, that when you, when you seek God, he responds. And, uh, and, and so this song, it means a lot to me. And it's also, you know, means a lot to people um, who have good memories of their father. And also, as we remember that, that God is the best father that we could ever have as well. So let's stand and, so, and also, before we sing it, it's also our offering. Uh, thank you very much for everyone that supported us in our offering and, uh, and continues to do. So let's stand and sing, Dear Lord and Father of Mankind. <laughs>
Let's turn to each other as we share the grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Please join us for refreshments and then go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.